disruption webinars. Um, we're going to begin at 8.45, probably a little bit before then. Um, but before we start, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, firstly, if you have any questions, um, you have two options. Um, Christian will be responding to the messages at the end of the webinar. However, you can type your questions in the chat box or you can wait till the end of the webinar to write your questions. Um, either way, I'll be reading them to Christian. So he'll give you, he'll give you the chance for him to answer your questions. Um, to begin with, if you have not muted yourself, now is the time to just mute yourself. And this is so that we can cancel out any background noise that's happening during the um, webinar so that other people aren't disrupted by this. Um, if you have any problems at all, you can just click my name and then you can send me a message directly and I'll be able to assist you if you have any questions or anything with your connectivity or um, being able to engage in the platform. And lastly, at the end of the survey, I will be sending everybody that participated a, um, a, a survey. So at the end of this webinar, I'll be sending everybody that participated a survey. And if you could just take five minutes to respond to the survey. And this survey just gives us insight on um, what, what you're interested, ha interested in, how we did, and what else you'd like to see from us. Um, so before we start, I'm just gonna quickly introduce you all to Christian. If you've not had the opportunity to um, be in a webinar with him before, um, Christian is one of our consultants here. Um, Christian Severi is one of our consultants at TFO Canada, and he has a 30 year career in international logistics. Um, he is based in a Montreal export consultancy since 2010 with Simplex, and he's active in two areas. He's a consultant to help SMEs grow internationally, and he also train, does training on logistics, customs, and regulatory aspects of international trade, free trade agreements, supply chain management, and other related issues. Um, he's also a lecturer for the Canadian International Freight Forwardness Association, and he gives seminars and, uh, and webinars for various trade organizations like the Montreal Chamber of Commerce, Commerce Invest Ottawa, Supply Chain Canada, and other similar, similar personalized training for importers and exporters. Um, he's also published articles in the Inside Logistics and Supply Professional. Um, so... Um, we're going to, I'm going to make um, Christian the host and he's going to begin um, in about two minutes. Um, are you ready, Christian? I am. Thank you very much, Rosalind. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're if you're in a different time zone, which I believe some of you may be. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to be presenting to you today. Thank you, Rosalind, for the introduction and um, for Marie Sabel for the invitation to come and speak to you today about the lessons learned from the Suez Canal blockage and other supply chain disruptions. Uh, I, I hope everyone can hear me well and can see the screen well. Um, if you have any technical issues, please reach out to Rosalind, um, as she indicated a moment ago. So uh, I have a, a little presentation for you, which will be about 45 minutes to an hour. And then we can have um, discussions and exchanges. And I look forward to be able to exchange with you at the end. Um, so I often have a little slide here where I introduce myself. However, the... Uh, Rosalina has kindly introduced me already, and uh, I do want to mention um, the fact that if you're interested in supply chain issues and international logistics issues um, from a North American context uh, point of view, I highly recommend the um, Inside Logistics and the Supply Professional publications that you see on the screen. They're both free. They're um, quite um, quite interesting. They're um, and so uh, it's, it's easy to register, it's easy to, to subscribe, it's free. Uh, you'll get good in insight on um, changes and, and current issues uh, relating to the international supply chain and international logistics as well. So I highly recommend them. Um, 
I do publish articles um, every now and then in these publications. And um, as I said, they're free, so take advantage of it. So the title and the um, of, of our presentation uh, today, of our, of our topic uh, today, um, refers to the uh, Suez Canal blockage, which I think everyone has heard about. It was quite interesting. It's uh, it's uh, it's very rare that we have such um, supply chain issues that uh, get such high up, high profile and so much uh, attention in the media. I think everyone who is who is um, who is not even vaguely interested or collected in, in the international supply chain or in international trade or importing or exporting has still heard about that. So it, it was quite a, an interesting case, I think, from, uh, from that point of view, is that it kind of made the um, supply chain challenges more um, obvious or more um, put them in the limelight, in, 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 in full light. Uh, whereas usually it's only the people who are directly involved in these kinds of activities who are knowledgeable about these things. So it's a, I, I, I consider it a, an interesting event, a good event, shall we say, from an education point of view, because everyone in the world now can relate to the fact that many of the goods that we consume um, are, have come from far away uh, and have been transported in one of these metal boxes in these huge container ships that we normally don't hear about because normally this trade flows um, smoothly um, and then once in a while there is a mishap like this and then everyone starts realizing oh yes all these goods that come from far away that's called globalization right this is the manifestation of what we've been calling globalization and so that was a high profile event and uh, there's quite a few things that are interesting to 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 think about and to realize from that and that's what we're going to talk about today. And so what is also original is that this evergreen, this giant Taiwanese container ship that blocked the, the Suez Canal for a week, got a lot of attention. And But it's not a straightforward um, um, case of, 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 of loss or accident or incident. It's a very unusual type of incident. And so it's very different from what we see sometimes in supply chain. Like for example, um, last December, there was a, a, a this Japanese container ship, the one Apus, who lost over 1800 containers in the Pacific during a storm, during a winter storm. And so you see that giant vessel here, um, it lost over 1800 containers. And then there was a number of containers that stayed on board, that stayed on the vessel that didn't fall overboard, but that got damaged. So it was quite a huge, uh, a huge incident, a huge claim. And so these things are, in a way, are, are more, almost more straightforward. You know, your cargo is either lost or it's not lost. Um, and then, uh, uh, this is uh, what happens sometimes. Luckily, it doesn't happen very often, but it, it does happen sometimes. Um, and uh, we have um, also, we've had relatively recently this tragedy in uh, off the coast of Sri Lanka, this container ship that was uh, brand new. That was only a few years, a few months old, I think, that, uh, that caught fire um, because of some chemicals that were improperly uh, package or likely it's like the likely cause to be from from that was that some chemicals that were not properly packaged and or not properly handled or documented and that, that caught on fire that ship unfortunately sank and so so these are more um I hate to say that, but they're more straightforward cases, like they're straight losses. So you have cargo, that's uh, you have goods that are that are traveling around the world and something happens. Unfortunately, you know, a, a tragedy happens and uh, then the cargo is lost. And um, uh, sometimes, uh, unfortunately, there's also loss of life. Um, uh, but these are... Um, don't happen often, but they they become what we call what I would call clear cut cases of, of of losses. And so, the evergreen, the ever given situation is completely different because it got the world's attention. Everybody has heard about it. Everybody now knows what a container ship looks like. 
everybody who is not very good in geography knows where the Suez Canal is, you know, uh, which sometimes people, many people weren't, wouldn't have been able to place it exactly. Um, and so the amazing thing and what is very different from what we, uh, what, from these tragedies that I was just referring to on the previous slides is that the goods are there, everything is fine. There's no, no problem, so to speak, as far as the cargo is concerned. Uh, and uh, as far as we know, there's no damage. Uh, it's just that the, um, this, cargo, this, this incident highlighted the fragility um, uh, of our supply chain. On, on, it highlighted the fact that a little incident like this happens, a giant container ship, um, because of the windy situations, or we don't exactly know how it happened yet, but um, likely weather conditions made it drift and, uh, and uh, get um, stuck in sand. And then um, what you have um, in, in within a few days is you have hundreds and hundreds of container ships of other ships, not just container ships, but also uh, vehicle carriers and uh, crude oil carriers, etc., that are stuck on both sides of the of the uh, canal. And uh, they were they were up to almost 500 ships blocked um, or stuck uh, at either end of the canal while this happened. And so. Um, it's a, a highly um, unusual type of situation, and we'll look at what it means also in terms of uh, of claims and losses, et cetera, et cetera. So just to just to give the um, perspective also on 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 who who is that who who is involved in this, uh, it also highlights the fact that in international logistics and in international transportation, there. Are, many different people involved and, and sometimes we don't really know them that well uh, they are they're usually some of them are low profile company uh, what we don't often uh, become aware of either is, is all the different players involved so here in this case the company that got the most attention is a company called Evergreen. It got attention because we see it on the ship, right? It has this huge name, this huge white letters, Evergreen. So Evergreen Marine Corporation is a Taiwanese company that has been operating for years. They are the seven largest in the world in terms of ocean container uh, capacity. Um, so it's a major player. Evergreen is a major player. Uh, from Taiwan, and we salute Taiwan on this occasion. Um, now, the ship owner, believe, believe it or not, is not evergreen. You see, this is something that happens frequently in international um, logistics, is that the, the operator of the vessel here, evergreen, doesn't actually own the vessel, doesn't own the ship. So that's very, very common. Um, it happens also in air transportation. Quite often, airlines don't own the planes, they lease them. From, from a company that owns them. So here we have a Japanese company that owns the vessel. And then what we also learned, which is not uh, always not, al not always known, is that actually to manage the ship itself and to manage the crew, it's actually another company that does that. It's a German company that does that, um, that manages you know, the, the, the crew and, and the, all the technical aspects of the vessel. And then the other thing that is quite common and, and well known, I think, around the around the world is that even though it's a Taiwanese, uh, it's, it's a Japanese owned container ship managed by a German company uh, and operated uh, from the transportation side by a Taiwanese company, it actually carries the flag of Panama, which is um, uh, the flag registry that many uh, ocean carriers use. It's called the flag of convenience because it's convenient and uh, and cheap. So um, why is that interesting is also is because from the legal uh, point of view, then it will all these countries or all these entities will be involved in one way or another. And so why did it get such attention is because hundreds of container ships were stuck at either side of the uh, Suez Canal, either on the um, uh, southern side or the northern side, awaiting for the uh, canal to be uh, reopened by uh, and waiting for that evergreen, that giant container ship to be freed from the mud, from the sand that it was stuck in. And so why is it important? Well, because about 15% of world trade goes through the canal. And, and as we know, um, because of uh, uh, globalization or thanks to globalization, there is a lot of goods that are moving, that are, that are 
that are um, being shipped uh, back and forth, imported, exporting all over the world. Uh, containers carry a lot of, um, of, of goods. Um, about 60% of goods that are transported by ocean are transported in containers and the, the balance is, uh, is shipped in bulk. So, um, and as I said a moment ago, up to almost 500 uh, other ships were stuck and waited for, for a week uh, for, the, for the, the evergreen vessel to be freed. So the Suez Canal has a long history, it was inaugurated, inaugurated in 1869. It was built by a French engineer um, who also uh, went on to begin the Panama Canal construction as well after the Suez Canal construction was completed. <laughs> Excuse me. So it links the Mediterranean uh, to the north, to the Red Sea, which then the Mediterranean then takes us to, through the Med through the Med to the to the Atlantic, and then the Red Sea takes us to the Indian Ocean, um, and then. The, the Pacific um, on the uh, eastern side. And then in the center, or more or less in the center, uh, there's a, a holding area, a lake that's called the Great Bitter Lake, uh, which is uh, um, uh, important. It's an important location because not all the, not, not uh, all parts of the canal allow two-way uh, movements. And so in some parts of the canal, it's narrow and you can only have one-way traffic. And so ships then park in the Great Bitter Lake uh, while waiting for um, other ships to go through and because um, two-way traffic is not possible everywhere. So we'll get back to the Great Bitter Lake in a moment. It's, quite, it's an interesting name too. We'll see. So Suez, yes, for those of us who are not 100% familiar with geography, um, maybe we weren't good in geography at school. Um, and so uh, we missed some of these points, but yes, Suez, um, as soon as the Suez Canal was op operational, then it enabled um, uh, vessel ships traveling between Asia and Europe to avoid having to go around the, 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 uh, around the uh, Good Hope uh, Cape um, at the tip of South Africa. And so that enabled ships to save about one week to, to 10 days, it's a, more like 10 days actually of, of sailing time. So of course, this link, the Suez Canal provides, uh, provides is very important, is vital for international trade because we can go between Europe and Asia in 10 days less than if we didn't have the canal. And of course that translates into costs, um, obviously. So that gives us a perspective of, uh, of why um, then all these ships waited. And so you see all these ships that we had, there was almost 500 ships that waited on both sides of the, um, of the canal. Uh, some took the decision to go around the, around South Africa, around the tip of Africa, but that, but not many did that. The majority, the vast majority of ships waited there for things to, um, to, um, to, to get back to normal because of the additional 10 days that it takes to go around, the, around the Africa and uh, additional cost, of course, a bunker fuel, fuel costs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so Suez is not the, um, is, is a very important um, um, tool for international trade. And so we call it a potential choke point, you know, and we had the illustration of that. I mean, the other major choke points, as we call them, are the Strait of Hormuz, which gets publicity, gets mentioned sometimes when there are incidents there between the various countries that are around it. And so, and that involves the difference with the Strait of Hormuz is that it really involves mainly petroleum products, you know, energy, um, uh, whereas Suez involves any kinds of, uh, of products. Um, the Strait of Malacca between Malaysia and Indonesia is also what's called a choke point because it's a very narrow passage. Uh, it's about 100 kilometers long, or more than that, I think. But it's a very, very narrow passage where there's, there's potential um, uh, trouble with uh, pirates and, and, and things like this. So it's also another um, choke points, as we call it. And then the Panama Canal, which links the Pacific to the Atlantic um, over about 100 kilometers. 
And uh, of course, when something happens there, then it would have, a, if, if something happens there, then it would have consequences because there's a huge amount of ships that, uh, and a huge volume of trade that goes via the Panama Canal uh, in both directions. Um, so these are the things, the, the, the choke points that we hear about sometimes um, in uh, international trade and, uh, and they have a big impact on uh, if anything goes wrong in one of these areas and it has a big impact. The impact, what's important to see is that the impact is felt everywhere because uh, of uh, globalization and the fact that so many goods are exchanged all over the world um, on a constant basis. So to go back to the ever given, just to give, a, give, a, give us a little bit more perspective. So we saw it was a giant container ship and um, it can carry 20,000, over 20,000 20 foot equivalent units. Now, some people to, to relate to that, some people talk about how that, that it's the size of five uh, soccer fields or it's the size of uh, five times the Empire State Building. I like to use the equivalent to give a perspective. I like to use uh, containers. So if you see this little container on the right hand side on a truck, so imagine over 20,000 of these containers can fit on this uh, on this boat. And so if you can imagine a, um, a lineup of these containers on a road somewhere, you can imagine the size, it gives you an idea of the size, uh, the magnitude of the, the, the cargo that it carries. So it was stuck in the mud, yes, in the Suez Canal for a week. And um, so traffic was halted because there's uh, in, in that section of the canal, it's only a one-way section. So uh, and it's narrow. So for over a week, for under slightly under a week, no ships could go through. And uh, so everyone, everyone, um, uh, or many companies were impacted by that, of course, and uh, uh, shipments got delayed, et cetera, et cetera. So it was stuck in the mud, but then luckily um, uh, on the seventh day or the sixth day or seventh day, it got freed. So traffic could come back to normal again uh, and gradually. It only took about a week or so to clear the backlog because um, uh, they run a pretty efficient operation there. And so what happened afterwards, <clears throat> excuse me, after the, um, the, the, the evergreen uh, ever given was freed from the, from the mud is that now it's stuck in legal lim limbo as we, as we call it, because um, the, obviously the, the rescue operation to be able to free the vessel from the sand and, and, uh, and um, have it continue its voyage uh, has um, costed a lot of money, obviously. So the Suez Canal Authority, the SCA, um, had, as soon as the ship was freed and inspected for seaworthiness to make sure it was, um, it was safe to travel, et cetera, et cetera, as soon as this was done, then the Suez Canal Authority went to a court and had that vessel, that ship arrested so that it could um, use that as a, as, as a way to get compensated for the costs that it took to um, free the vessel. And so the Suez Canal Authority um, launched a lawsuit against the owner of the vessel. That's the Japanese company we talked about a moment ago. And uh, they launched an almost $1 billion lawsuit, and which was, uh, I think, completely unreasonable. And um, eventually, uh, in May, May 11th, the, um, uh, they brought it down to $600 million, which is probably also grossly exaggerated. And then in May 25th, they kind of signaled the SCA, the Suez Canal Authority, signaled that they may release the ship against a $200 million uh, guarantee, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and that's also because, uh, yes, the Suez Canal Authority is suing the owner of the vessel uh, for the cost and also for lost uh, revenue. Uh, but um, also the vessel owner in the meantime is suing the Suez Canal Authority because they are losing revenue in the meantime while their, their ship is stuck. So it's a kind of a, it's a very tricky situation. And um, it's uh, the only people who are going to win in this is lawyers really who are helping or who are, who are working for the different entities. Um, so it's quite an interesting situation. That ship is currently anchored in the Great Bitter Lake that we saw a moment ago. Remember, that's the lake that's kind of in the middle that is held, that is used as a holding area. So 
the goods are there, and uh, but the, the ship is still there. It's it's not in the mud anymore. It's it's free. Uh, it's been freed from the mud, and traffic is 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 is, uh, is uh, goods are able ships are able to transit through the canal in both directions with no problem. It's back to normal. It's business as usual, except that. All these these container is currently still anchored in the uh, in the middle of the canal at the, on the, in the Great Bitter Lake, um, and uh, um, so if you have uh, if you have cargo on board, then you're really stuck because um, there's actually nothing you can do. Um, the vessel has been freed uh, from the mud, so it, it can try and, it, and it's safe. It has been inspected. It's in, it's in fine of condition. It has, did not get any, it did not get damaged in any way. It's seaworthy. So it could continue the voyage. However, it's, uh, it's being arrested by Egyptian authorities so they can get the owner to pay, uh, the cost of the salvage operation. And, um, also get compensated. Egypt wants to get compensated by for a loss of revenue, loss of reputation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, really, if you have cargo on on that vessel, and uh, obviously there are many companies are involved in this because um, when we have a ship carrying uh, twenty thousand containers, well, you can imagine that involves a lot of company, a lot of people. Uh, there's companies like, for example, IKEA is reported to have a hundred containers of furniture on that vessel, on that ship that is parked, anchored in the Great Bitter Lake. And so, the the, the unfortunate thing is that, uh, um, contrary to what we saw earlier, you see, remember I showed you these pictures of these tragedies at sea, and the reason I showed you these pictures, I wanted to, to, to show you these, uh, these, uh, these tragedies was just to highlight the fact that in cases like this, if cargo is lost, well, then it becomes a claim. It becomes an insurance claim and it's relatively easy to sort out. Um, and you, you, then you, you get compensated by the insurance and then you order, you place a new order for a replacement order. But here, it's completely different. If you're IKEA or if you're another company or one of the companies that has cargo on board, and there's many of them, then there's no insurance for that. There's no, 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 no insurance that exists that will protect you if the vessel that carries your containers gets stuck like this by, uh, due to a legal situation, uh, as we have seen. And so this is the, an important thing to keep in mind is that... Uh, Cargo insurance is great for um, to protect ourselves as a risk management tool when we are exporting or importing products internationally. However, delays uh, is something that you cannot uh, purchase insurance for. So you can't protect you. You can't protect yourself against the situations like this, against potential delays uh, or the, the costs caused by a delay. Um, you simply have no claim because uh, cargo insurance relies on something physical happening to the goods, that the goods have to be damaged or there has to be something or stolen or fall in the water, then you can claim. If nothing happens to the goods, they're still on the ever given in the Great Bitter Lake, then you don't have a claim. The only claim that exists really is the claim that the um, Suez Canal Authority has, has lodged against the vessel owner. And uh, then there's a claim, the vessel owner is claiming lost revenue against the Suez Canal Authority because the, the ship has been impounded in the meantime. And really, in fact, the negotiations uh, on that are, are actually taking place between the Suez Canal Authority and the, the vessel's insurance company, because um, they are the ones who, are, who, 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 will be, who will be covering that. They're covering the owner and the operators. So it's the UK p &I, uh, group that uh, has that insurance. So really the negotiations are between the vessel insurance and the uh, Suez Canal Authority. And so far, um, there's been no conclusion that that vessel is still there. And so one thing that is very, um, very interesting uh, also from a, an education point of view is that, okay, so you, if you have cargo there, you're stuck. You have to wait for the situation to be resolved. And then once the situation is resolved between the ship owner, operator, and the Suez Canal Authority, the vessel will continue and will discharge its cargo and you'll be able to get your cargo. However, it won't be that simple. And here is why, is because in the meantime, the owner of the vessel has, has called, has declared what's called general average. So general average 
is is a, is a legal uh, is a legal principle that exists that has existed for a number of years um, in um, maritime transportation, and it's um, it's included or it's 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 um, uh, dealt with something called the York Antwerp Rules, um, and so uh, it, it's a perfectly legal uh, process that is used universally around the world for maritime transactions. And under that process, it enables the owner of the vessel to, um, when the vessel gets into unexpected situations and unexpected costs arise, um, it enables the owner of the vessel to get all the cargo owners to pay for the damages or to pay for the costs of the repair operations. Um, and so we have this very odd situation now is that in that if you have cargo on the ever, ever given um, that is currently parked in the Great Bitter Lake, it's going to be a while until you get your cargo. Why? Because once, as once the ship is freed by Egyptian authorities and it brings its cargo to the port of discharge, so the main port of discharge is Rotterdam, then in order to get your cargo, you'll have to pay a general average uh, compensation to the owner. And there'll be no way around it. There'll be no legal way around it. So you're actually, you, you're stuck with that if you, if you have cargo on board that vessel because, and you'll have to contribute, you'll have to pay part of the cost um, of freeing the vessel. So whatever the settlement is between the owner and the um, insurance company, some of that cost is actually going to be paid by the shippers, by the companies that have cargo on board. Believe it or not, it's extremely unfair for cargo owners. It's extremely unfair for importers and exporters, but that's how it works. That's how it is. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. This is how it's been working for years in maritime law. Where do you see this? Uh, if you're interested to know about that uh, and where you could check it out on your own, if you're, if you're dealing with shipments or with, with importing and exporting, look up an ocean bill of lading. This is the, um, the shipping um, document that's issued by the carrier um, that contains the terms and conditions of the contract. Um, so if you look at the, if you look at an evergreen bill of lading, for example, you flip it and look on the back, you'll see the fine print. And on the fine print uh, that you see on the right-hand side of the screen here, there's all kinds of little clauses that are very hard to read. You need a, a magnifying glass to read them. They're also very hard to understand because it's all legal lingo. It's all lingual jargon. And so you'll find clause 27 in that shipping document, in that contract of carriage, you'll find a, a clause that will say general average, and it will say, as per international rules, as per the York Antwerp rules, um, we, the owner of the vessel or the operator of, of the vessel, if we run into um, ex unexpected difficulties, we have the right to get all the cargo owners to contribute towards the cost of the uh, operation, whatever it is that, 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 that happens. So it's quite a powerful um, thing and it's quite a, uh, also, it's quite a risky um, uh, thing to know about, or it's a, it's a, it's a potentially high risk for shippers, for companies that do uh, buying or selling of, of goods and that ship them by boat. You know, if you're only shipping goods by air, there is no such clause. Um, or if you're shipping truck, goods by truck or by rail, there's no such clause, but by ocean, by boat, these clauses apply all over the world and they're part of standard trading conditions of ocean carriers. If you're interested in that, to learn more about that process, the, the, the biggest claim, the biggest case of general average uh, that took place ever was, uh, was in 2018. It was a Maersk vessel that caught fire <laughs> on the way between Asia and uh, the Mediterranean. And uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to look it up in Inside Logistics. There was an article published in September of 2018 that explains how general average works and uh, how it's tied to cargo insurance. So you see, in the case of the Maersk Honam, if you, if you read the second last line at the bottom, companies that had cargo on the Maersk Honam um, in order to get their cargo at destination, once it got, once it's finally got delivered, you know, a few months later, um, they had to pay 42% plus 11.5%. So they had to pay 54% um, of the value of the goods to Maersk in order to get their goods. 
and that's part of the general average uh, legal condition. So it's something very, very um, important for companies that do buying and selling, that do importing and exporting to know about this. Many, sometimes people don't know that or, or, and also we don't know that because it doesn't happen very often. But when it happens, of course, then it can be very costly. And for a large company, like for IKEA, for example, it's not going to be a huge deal, but for, for an SME, for a small and medium-sized company, having to um, repay for your goods in a way in order to get them, you know, uh, three or four or six months later, uh, is enough to get a small company, to drive a small company out of business. So it's a very unfair type of um, uh, legal uh, situation, but that's that's how it is. So it's part of the risks of doing business. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to point out um, also um, is that uh, just to make the distinction between a general average case and 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 a standard case. Here, back in May, you remember that's the that's that same vessel I mentioned a while ago um, on, a, on, a, on a previous slide, the Express Pearl, that uh, that had a fire. Um, off the coast of Sri Lanka. Um, now that the vessel owner declared general average um, at the time, uh, which would have meant that um, every cargo owner actually would have had to pay for the cost of extinguishing the fire, uh, basically is what it meant. However, uh, general average did not proceed because in the end, um, the vessel sank. So even though that was for a short while, it was a general average case, but actually it turned out to, to not be a general average case. And so that enables me to highlight the fact that general average only works if, uh, is only used uh, if, the, if the voyage is successful, you know, if, if, the, if the boat is able to continue its voyage and deliver its cargo. So here in the, in the case of the Express Pearl, even though at some point the vessel owner declared general average, which, which, would have, which would have made everyone with cargo on board liable for the cost of extinguishing the fire. Actually, the ship, the ship, the fire was extinguished. The crew was saved, was evacuated. There was no loss of life, uh, thankfully. But then the vessel sank eventually. So then that became a standard loss. Uh, as we were discussing at the beginning, as a standard clear-cut loss, a, a total loss of a shipment. So this did not was not a general average case in the end. And so yes, general average is uh, is something that we have to be aware of. Um, now the good thing is that if you have cargo insurance, then um, the standard cargo insurance clauses include protection against general average, um, and so it, it's something to be aware of. So. Uh, the moral to the story here is that if you were thinking that uh, insurance is not important, you know, some companies say to themselves, oh, well, why should I pay for insurance, for cargo insurance? You know, situations, losses don't happen very often. Uh, therefore, uh, I don't want to pay pr an insurance premium on, on every shipment that I, that I send. If I, get, if I have a, a claim, if there's a loss, I'll pay out of my pocket. Uh, because it doesn't happen very often. Well, that would be the wrong assumption to make because um, even though um, in some cases there will be no loss, uh, but there could still be uh, high cost. Uh, and so that such a case would be general average. In general average situations, maybe your cargo will not get lost, but you'll have very high cost. You could have to pay up to 50% of the cargo or 54% of your cargo value in order to get it. And so, Cargo insurance covers you for that also. So um, that's an important um, element to know about in, in risk management. Um, now, talking about cargo insurance, I wanted to, what I wanted to share with you also is the fact that uh, why is it important for companies to consider to, 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 to take cargo insurance is because carriers have limits of liability. Uh, and so if you if you imagine or if you think that um, if you, that if your shipment is lost, uh, if you think the carrier will reimburse you the value of your goods, then forget it. You're dreaming. It won't happen. Carriers have contractual limits of liability, whether it's a trucking company, whether it's a um, an airline, whether it's an ocean line. If they lose your shipment, if your shipment gets damaged, gets lost, gets um, if your container falls in the water, if your pallet is stolen, etc., uh, uh, etc., et 
uh, you'll never get your full value back from the carrier because carriers have limits of liability. And so you have them here on screen. And that also applies to express companies. You know, if you're selling goods by e-commerce, um, um, with express companies like uh, DHL or FedEx or UPS, and the, your goods are lost, you never get reimbursed um, for the value of your goods uh, because carriers have limits of liability. And that's why uh, it's very important to take cargo insurance. Now, one of us here has, uh, has, uh, has his or her microphone on. Could you please turn it off? Because it does create a little bit of background noise. I'm not sure who it is. Um, if you would please mute your microphone, that would be highly appreciated. Thank you very much. And so you might ask me, where do we know about these limits of liability of carriers? How do we find out? How can, how can we find out about that? What is the liability, maximum liability of the carrier who carries my goods? And uh, so where we see it actually is on the shipping documents. You, you don't see it in the front of the shipping document. And it's, this is an ocean document that I have here, but the same would apply for an airline document, an airway bill. You see that on the back of the bill of lading uh, in the fine print. And it's in technical legal jargon, which is hard to understand and hard to decipher. It takes, uh, not only it takes a lawyer to understand that, but it takes a specialized lawyer, a specialized maritime law lawyer. So you find this in all shipping documents, uh, no matter what the mode is, there's fine print that uh, basically says that if something happens, the carrier um, is only liable up to a certain amount and never for the full value of cargo. And then you also see in these terms and conditions at some point, the clause that I showed you a moment ago about general average. Remember it was clause 27. So all shipping contracts, that, and for general average, that would apply only for ocean shipments and not for air shipments, of course, of course. And so cargo insurance, and then we'll end there. Uh, as far as the uh, talk about insurance, I just wanted to show that to you also as well for information, just so that you know that when you, when you take cargo insurance, as a, which is an excellent risk management tool, it protects you for against what happens, what may happen to your cargo while it's on the way. It also protects you for in case of general average declarations, then you're covered for that. And so what I want to show you is the fact that it doesn't matter in which country you are or which insurance company you deal with, there are international clauses that govern cargo insurance. And this is what they look like. They're called the Institute Cargo Clauses. There's three main ones that are being used around the world. It's the clauses A, B, and C. So just a little technical information just for, for info. So let's go back now to the Ever Given, which as, a, as we speak is still anchored in the Great Bitter Lake. So we saw that companies now, can, all companies can do is, is wait. Uh, they are stuck. They have to wait for that vessel to be freed by by the Suez Canal Authority and then deliver its cargo. And then as we saw also uh, a moment ago, once the uh, cargo will be, uh, will be discharged at the final destinations, then um, there's the question of general average. And so somebody, whoever has cargo on board will have to dish out a general average uh, payment to the ship owner in order to get uh, his or her cargo. So the question now to, that we want to look at because that's that's the, the the major point really is whose problem is it what is um uh, yes now we saw we see now the, the that the, the containers are stuck on the vessel and they've been there since march and we're in june and we don't know if they'll be delivered by september or december or march next year nobody knows uh, and so whose problem is it if you have cargo on board if you're the seller if you're the buyer is it um is it the seller's problem? Is it the exporter's problem? Is it the importer's problem? Whose problem is it? You might say to me, it depends on who the owner is, and that would be um, that would be true in part. And I think, and actually, the key element here, what decides or what tells us whose problem it is, is 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 determined by the inco term. Now, inco terms. For those of you who are not familiar with inco terms. There are international rules that, um, that are published and updated every 10 years. They're published by the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, um, the ICC. 
And uh, the latest version that we use is the 2020 versions. They are updated every 10 years. So the latest one when it came out on January 1st, 2020. Uh, and they define the INCO terms as three letter abbreviations that define the sharing of, re of responsibilities and costs between a seller and a buyer. Um, and so basically, the INCO term is, is what tells us who pays for what, who arranges what as far as delivering the goods, as far as logistics. What, what does the shipper do? What does the buyer do? Who pays for what up to, um, up to what point in terms of? you know, packaging, delivering, insurance, customs, duties, customs, taxes, et cetera, et cetera, inspection, all the logistics costs. Who pays? Who arranges what part of the logistics movement and who pays for the for, for what part of the cost? But there's something else that's governed by the INCO terms that is very interesting that's worth taking a moment to think about here is that INCO terms also define the sharing of risks, the division of risks between a seller and a buyer. What does that mean, the sharing of risks? That means if something happens to the cargo, whose risk it was, whose loss was it? You know, if something happens, something like this happens, well, is it the shipper's loss or is it the buyer's loss? And so why is that extremely important is because in the inco terms rules, um, there's actually four inco terms that are not logical. They are totally counterintuitive and uh, it's worthwhile to look into that and, and it's very important, it's fundamental if you're importing or exporting goods overseas, it's fundamental to be aware of this uh, very specific, very special um, situation where there's four inco terms where the sharing of the risks is illogical, is counterintuitive. So the inco terms, they look like this. Um, um, you have... Um, Four inco terms on the left side that are used for ocean uh, movements. Um, and then you have seven on the right hand side that are used for multimodal, i.e., container ship, ocean containers, air shipments, rail, or truck shipments, you know, surface uh, movements. And so the key thing here, the fundamental thing, fundamental thing to remember here is that there's one, the ones that are logical. Out of the 11 inco terms, there's four inco terms that you have on the screen now where it's the buyer who looks after the shipping, right? So it's X works, FCA, FAS, FOB. Uh, the buyer arranges the shipment and pays for the cost. So therefore, if you had containers on the ever given and you had, and you had, and your inco term was X works, FCA, FAS, or FOB, then it is your problem. It is your loss, so the the buyer would have would be on the hook for the uh, for, for for the cargo is as far as the cargo is concerned because the seller had no responsibility in terms of delivering the merchandise. Uh, it's the buyer who picked up the merchandise, um, and so that's for these four inco terms. And then there's three inco terms where there it's the seller's problem. It's the seller's problem because. The seller, if um, if we use one of these three inco terms, DAP, DPU, DDP, the seller arranges for the for the for the shipping of the goods, and the seller also has the risks. So, if you had cargo on the ever given, and your inco term was DAP, DPU, DDP, and, and if you were the seller, then then you're on the hook. Then 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 it's your problem. It's it's your your cost. Uh, including the general average uh, contribution. And so where it gets tricky and where some companies sometimes don't realize is that there's four inco terms where, remember um, on the previous slide, I said there's four inco terms where the transfer of risk is counterintuitive. What does that mean? That means that even though the freight, the logistics costs are paid by the seller, um, goods actually travel at the buyer's risk. And so, is, and so this is what is very tricky. Um, if you bought goods, if you purchase goods uh, uh, under the CFR, CIF, CPT, or CIP inco term, um, and your goods are on the um, ever given in the Great Bitter Lake, then it's your problem. Even though the seller arranged and paid for the freight cost, 
the goods travel at the buyer's risk as soon as they leave the point of uh, shipment, the, the, the place of shipment at, at the country of origin. So this is what is very tricky about the INCO terms. The, the INCO term is what is, is telling us, is going, to, is going to be telling us whose risks, um, is, whose risk, who, who at the risk during the, uh, or during the transportation, during the ocean transportation. And that applies to any mode of transportation. And so these four inco terms are tricky um, because on, on the other seven inco terms, which we saw earlier, the shifting, the transfer of the risk is logical. And on the previous ones, if you remember, if the seller pays for the freight, then he's also he also has the risk. Whereas um, the uh, X Works and the FCA FOB, we said there is the buyer who pays for the freight. Therefore, he has the risk. He or she has the risk. But for these four inco terms, is different because even though the seller arranged and paid for the transport costs, then the goods travel at the buyer's risk. So it's very important if you're on the buying side. Um, it's a very important um, uh, detail, fundamental detail to know about um, uh, that the fact that if you buy goods under these inco terms as a buyer, then you have the risks if something happens, something like what the happened to the ever given. Um, and of course, also if there's a loss, if the goods are fall in the water, if, uh, if the goods catch fire. And so that is the key element to, to talk to, to, to keep in mind here. And one of the main lessons learned, I guess we could say from uh, this incident or this, um, uh, yes, this incident uh, in, in, this, in the Suez Canal, um, which lasted um, the, first, the first act of that, uh, of that situation, of that incident uh, only lasted a week. And then the ship was freed after a week, but then we don't know how long the second act will take and when the cargo will be able to be delivered at destination. So the main lesson learned here is remember, yes, the power of the INCO term. The INCO term is a fundamental tool in international trade, in buying and selling goods, because it's going to say who pays for what, who arranges for what, but also at what stage the risks are transferred, are shifting from the seller to the buyer. And so whether you are you looking at it from a seller's point of view or a buyer's point of view, it's very important to be aware of that. Other lesson learned is that we saw why it was important to take cargo insurance um, for your goods and or always ask yourself, should I take cargo insurance or not? You know, and then that depends also on the INCO term to a certain extent. It also depends on the terms of payment. So cargo insurance is an, is an important tool uh, for risk management and don't, don't discount it by saying to yourself, oh, well, um, accidents don't happen very often. So um, why should I pay for this? It's worthwhile, particularly in cases of general average that we saw, because if we, are, if we run into a general average case, or if we're involved in a general average case, or if our goods are on, in, involved in a general average case, we're covered by standard cargo insurance. Um, and it's one of the rare cases where cargo insurance is useful, even though there's no damage to goods. And then the other lesson learned is that there's no, you can't take insurance, you can't protect yourself against delays. If there's a delay, if you were, if something happens um, that your goods do arrive, but, but they arrive late, you can't protect yourself against that. You can't purchase insurance uh, against that. You were just very unlucky. If you had cargo on the ever given, you were very unlucky. It was really your unlucky week. Um, of course, longer supply chains involve more risks. So of course, we're all conscious of that. The more, yes, the more stretched your supply chain is, either from the selling side or from the buying side, then there'll be more risk, obviously. Um, Inventory management, we saw how, how companies were impacted by, by these delays caused by the Suez, Suez Canal blockage. Uh, and of course, it's very damaging to companies because everyone is operating, as we know, has been operating on the just-in-time concept because, because it's cheaper this way. You know, have, have, have no inventory, have as little inventory as possible in order to save inventory costs and have your suppliers deliver goods just in time. This is kind of what's been driving industry for the last 20 years or so. Uh, and so we saw the limits of that. We saw that uh, when, uh, if you operate 
strictly on just in time, well, then, of course, you'll have to, your, your factory, your plant will have to shut down because if, if, you're, if, you're, if your parts or raw materials or components are stuck in the Suez Canal for a week um, or, or, or six months in the case of the ever given. So it brought, it highlighted the, more, the importance of having a buffer stocks as much as possible, you know, have buffer stocks just in case is becoming more and more important. It's also becoming important in the context of the pandemic where buyer patterns have been changing, consumer patterns have been changing, have been shifting. And so uh, companies that had buffer stocks are doing better than companies that didn't have buffer stocks. And then indeed, yes, have backup plans of have backup suppliers, don't rely only on one supplier for each of your components, I have several suppliers so that the risk is spread to a certain extent and nearshoring, even though it's uh, in some cases, it's a bit like wishful thinking. We saw it when we, um, when many countries around the world realized that they were not prepared for the pandemic, that they had no uh, personal protection equipment available. And needed, they needed to rely on um, China as being the, the main source, if not the only source of personal protection equipment. So of course that can be avoided by doing near shoring or, but that's, that's a, an interesting general principle that is not always um, possible to put in practice. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a bigger, a bigger issue. And so one thing that, uh, that is also one, one lesson to be learned about this um, ever given is that one way to have maybe have less risk, you know, you could say to yourself, okay, so if something happens to me, uh, if I'm, let's say I'm IKEA and I have a hundred containers of furniture coming from Asia, going into Europe, um, I could say to myself, okay, I'm not going to, to, to send my hundred containers with evergreen. I'm going to send, send only 30 with evergreen. I'm going to send 30 more with somebody else, let's say Costco, and then I'll send the remaining 40 with CGM, for example, right? Or three different carriers. So that could be a good risk management tool. Um, however, and they would not necessarily, like, we have to be a bit careful about that because you see, if you look at this vessel, I know I've showed it to you many times and now you're getting, you're getting tired of seeing this picture, but let's look at it one last time, please. You see these, these green boxes, these green containers, they belong to Evergreen, this Taiwanese company. But do you know the blue ones actually belong to a competitor of Evergreen called CMA CGM, a French company. And the brown ones actually belong to Costco, a Chinese company that is also a competitor of Evergreen. And so what happens is that in ocean shipping around the world, these companies, they compete against each other, but actually, on the other side, they also work together in some way. And so in this case, the evergreen vessel was not just carrying goods, um, containers from the evergreen corporation of Taiwan. It was also cover, uh, carrying, transporting um, containers belonging to CMA CGM, which is the third largest uh, ocean container in the world, and Costco OCL, uh, which is number four. So you see, if we said we were, we, 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 one, one risk management um, tool at our disposal is to spread the risks. And that would be quite valid to say that, quite fine to say that. I'm not going to put all my eggs in the same basket. Whenever I have three containers to ship or wherever I have two containers to ship, I'm not going to send them with the same company. I'm going to send them with two different companies. But so you have to keep in mind that some of these companies, even though they are competitors, they actually work together. And then, so if you had two containers to ship that week, you ship one with Evergreen, uh, a Taiwanese company, you ship one with Costco, a Chinese company, they end up on the same boat. Or if you ship it with a, one with Evergreen, one, CM, one with CMA, CGM, they actually end up on the same boat. So it's something, it's a bit amusing, but, uh, but I think it's, it's fun to, to know that, you know, and so keep that in mind. And what is happening, I would say, in, in, in generally speaking, in the world of ocean transportation, I just wanted to share with you this chart, this recent chart of the, the biggest, who are the biggest ocean carriers in the world. Maersk is still the first one. They have been for many years, but um, the Mediterranean shipping is catching up to them. And you see CMA, CGM is um, coming number three, Costco in um, number four, you see Evergreen in number seven. So you see um, CMA 
uh, Costco and Evergreen work together, and then Maersk and MS MSC work together. So all these carriers have a, a, agreements between themselves that make things a little bit more tricky for shippers because um, there's actually less and less choices available. And this is one of the one of the problems that we have in, in ocean shipping and in, in, in supply chain management is that there's less choices available as far as carriers are concerned. About 85% of ocean trade is, is, is concentrated or is, is, uh, is handled by, by the first 10 ocean carriers. So what other supply chain disruptions have we seen? And then that will take us to our, the end of our presentation, presentation and we will be able, to, uh, I'll be able to address your question and we'll be able to exchange. I'll be happy to exchange with you, of course, um, on some of these topics. So looking at the broadest, at a, broad, on, on, a, at a, on a higher level, one of the uh, main issues that has been happening as far as ocean transportation is concerned is that rates have gone very high. Rates are extremely high. There's also a shortage of containers, which is very penalizing for, particularly for agri-shippers, for many agri-shippers around the world. There's congestion at ports, not just caused by the Suez Canal blockade, but also because uh, of the increase in volume that has taken place as countries emerge from the pandemic, particularly in the US that started to emerge out of the pandemic in, in the fall. There's been a big increase in volume. Um, and so as a result, there's congestions um, at, at many ports. Uh, it started on the US West Coast, but it's also happening in China now. And rates keep on rising actually. Uh, on the ocean, on the ocean side, for air transportation, then there's yes, there's capacity shortage, there's higher rates. Rates are about double what they used to be uh, prior to the pandemic, and one of the big factors, one of the big disruptor of supply chains, is also the rise in e-commerce. That uh, you know, e-commerce was increasing before the pandemic, was already growing at a, at a fast pace, and uh, but now it has, uh, with the pandemic, it has really. Um, created uh, a huge demand in e-commerce. Everyone buys goods online, and that has, that is a big disruptor in supply chains because it changes the way goods are being distributed. Uh, so it ha it has a big impact on um, supply chain management uh, for for many companies. IP challenges. We'll touch on that very briefly. Commodity prices are are. are, are are, are extremely high. We know um, there's a um, high cost in, in, uh, in forest products, uh, uh, steel, aluminium, um, copper, uh, some agri commodities, corn, soybeans. I mean, sometimes this or very often it's, it's very positive for producers because as, as prices of commodities go up, then of course it makes it makes more revenue for producers of these commodities. So it's not all, it's not entirely negative. It's actually very positive in some ways, but uh, it, it disrupts the supply chain. Um, and then yes, the trade is actually getting more complex. So we'll touch on that very briefly. I like to use this one. Um, trade complexities um, uh, created by, by the multiplication of trade deals. And it's true that there's may, may, m more and more trade deals, you know, instead of having global deals that, in, that involve the World Trade Organization, there's separate deals between countries. And so that adds the level of complexity. So one that I find a bit amusing is the one that involves the UK. So you know the UK left the European Union uh, on January 1st, Via, through the Brexit process. So it's quite amusing what's been happening. It's been it's relatively, yeah, quite amusing because the UK left their neighbors, their European neighbors, which creates a lot of disruption for, for UK companies. Um, but they are joining uh, a, a free trade agreement or they want to join a free trade agreement with Pacific countries, even though the UK is nowhere near the Pacific. So what impact does it have for companies? it makes things more complicated because if you're a UK trader or a UK company or even for Canadian companies, it makes things more complicated because for, for let's just talk about the Canadian perspective just for a second. I know it's, it's not your primary focus, but just to illustrate that, and, and I find that interesting. Canada has a free trade agreement with the European Union, which made deal, which made straight, made 
trade simple between Canada and the European Union. So when the UK leaves the European Union, then it's a separate trade agreement that we have. So it makes things more complex for UK companies. It makes things more complex for Canadian companies uh, because they, when they deal in Europe, in Europe, they have two trade agreements, one with the European Union, one with the UK. And then, so now with the UK joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, of which Canada is, part, is a part, then there's going to be two sets of rules for Canadian companies to deal with the UK. There'll be the UK Free Trade Agreement rule, um, the UK-Canada Free Trade Agreement, and then there'll be the Trans-Pacific Partnership rule. And so for UK companies, it makes it even more complex because the UK uh, wants to join the, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but it also has a free trade agreement with Canada, and it also has a free trade agreement with Japan, and it has one with the EU, and it wants to have one with Australia and the Trans-Pacific. So companies actually, even though um, the, this, this increase of trade deals might look good for companies um, because it opens markets. It actually makes things more complex for in, in many cases. So there is a um, there is something about that that makes um, that, that is not great for for companies. Um, trade complexities, um, online trade. Yes, uh, e-commerce. There's a huge growth of e-commerce. Um, e-commerce sales in the U.S. represented 14. 14% of the total, but that's the 2020 stats. So it's probably um, even higher now. I think now it's close to 20%. So that has an impact, a huge impact on how goods are distributed. It drives distributors out of business and it increases uh, monopolies or creates quasi monopolies with companies like Amazon, for example, or Alibaba controlling a bigger and bigger share of trade. Now, what's interesting, I know the topic is not, uh, not e-commerce and I know we're also running out of time. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I find it interesting to see uh, the evolution of the um, of e-commerce in the US, um, you know, in, pan in the pan pandemic times, uh, of course, um, uh, personal uh, care uh, equip, uh, supply goods and, and sporting goods and hobby goods were quite uh, uh, increased the most. But what I find interesting now is that even food and beverages uh, or food and beverage has the highest, uh, one of the highest growth uh, rate in e-commerce and building materials. So um, that means that in the US, people buy their food more and more by, by their food online and buy building materials or garden equipment and supplies online, which is from an, env an environmental point of view, a total disaster because it's, it's disrupting the whole distribution process and it also putting more trucks on the road and uh, more waste of, um, of packaging material, et cetera, et cetera. But I find it's interesting to see the pattern, to see which, which um, uh, that some products continue to, um, to, to, to grow a lot or in, in, in e-commerce. It's a bit worrying, I find. And uh, even in a post-pandemic world, e-commerce has the potential to be a great disruptor and uh, also um, create a lot of waste and being very bad for the environment. Um, the, 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 whole, the whole concept of free shipping that's been put forward by companies like Amazon is totally irresponsible. Uh, free shipping, free returns, that's totally responsible from, a, you know, um, not only from an economic point of view, but also from an environmental point of view. Um, shipping is not free. Uh, it costs something. Uh, it costs something financially. It also costs something uh, on, the, on the environment. And this graph here, which I, which I like to use sometimes, is just to highlight the fact that when companies that are that are shipping by e-commerce or selling by e-commerce spend a lot more, a much higher percentage um, the, than um, on logistics than, than traditional retailers. So that's just one way to uh, demonstrate that uh, um, e-commerce increases costs, you know, logistics costs and, and waste and not good for the economy, uh, not good for the environment, that's for sure. And so as a result of the pandemic, as a result also of the growth of e-commerce, there's huge um, cost increases um, in, in the US. And uh, I'm using US data because I think it highlights what's happening around the world. I think it's not purely in the US. And so all this adds up to, to basically driving costs up 
uh, you know, transportation costs are going up, warehousing costs are going up, the cost of keeping inventories are going up. So this is a little bit what's waiting, what, what's, what's hitting us, what's starting to hit us in the post-pandemic world. And because of, uh, for many reasons, including the, the pandemic itself, but also other disruptors in supply chain, costs are increasing and uh, ip protection i just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, yes it is also a problem um, a lot of uh, counterfeit goods are being seized these are just the uh, 2019 statistics so one way to protect yourself against that and we should re re reaffirm that with exporters in in all our countries in in, in the countries that you represent protect your IP, protect file for intellectual property protection, file to protect your, your brand, your logo, your image, et cetera, et cetera. So in Canada, it's with uh, uh, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. In the EU, for example, UEPO is very practical. You can file, you do with one filing, your IP is protected in 27 countries. So just a little aside to remind companies about that, to protect their IP. Um, we touched a moment ago on the fact that air freight costs have increased a lot, and that's because of the fact that in normal times, about half of the air cargo that we ship worldwide, and many goods are shipped by air, they could be perishable, they could be fragile, they could be fashion, they could be um, high value, a lot of goods are sent by air. Um, and since the pandemic, as we all know, there's, there's very few flights available. There's very few passenger flights. And so you see the, the, the reason air freight rates have gone up a lot is that because is that there's no passenger flights. And in, you, in normal times, half of air cargo worldwide is shipped on passenger flights, you know, in the belly of the plane together with baggage. And because we don't have these flights, Right now, then there's less capacity, and therefore rates are air rates are very high. They are starting to come down, though. So luckily, airlines have started to carry freight in in um, in the passenger cabin of, of planes, like you see here. I mean, that was particularly at the beginning of the pandemic to transport personal protection equipment, and uh, also airlines have started to convert some of their planes into to to carry cargo. Like uh, Air Canada has been a leader on that. And so it's the temporary conversion of passenger flights, uh, passenger planes to care to enable the transportation of cargo. So that's done on a temporary basis until, you know, until there's more demand for uh, passenger flights. And uh, that is great, helping companies greatly to transport um, the cargo by air. And uh, there's also more permanent conversions that are being done. So Air Canada has just announced actually yesterday or the day before uh, that it's converting planes into freighters so that's going to help a lot and so these are more what we looked at earlier are temporary conversions but now these are more uh, permanent conversions they are actually uh, going to transform some of their planes into actual freighters um, meaning not just remove seats but also uh, configure the aircraft in a different way in order to maximize the transportation of air cargo. So that's going to be very helpful for trading companies, for exporters. Uh, for example, here, Air Canada has, has announced that their new freighters that are coming in the, in the fall um, will be serving um, Ecuador, Peru, and uh, and Mexico. So these are new new uh, new ways to be able to uh, to ship goods by air and briefly in order to end uh, the presentation i wanted to highlight the fact we talked about cargo con port congestion so that is a big problem worldwide it started in the us west coast but uh, it's also happening in europe it's also happening in china now there's congestion at ports which creates delays which creates higher costs for trading companies um, Ocean rates have gone up uh, drastically, um, particularly between Asia and Europe and between Asia and um, North America. And, uh, and it has an impact on, on the whole world because if carriers can make so much money on one lane, you know, on the lane between um, China and, and US West Coast, for example, then um, they'll put all their capacity there. Um, and if they don't put all their capacity there, they'll also increase rates on other lanes because why should they, you know, why should they lose money in other lanes? So even though it's specific to the, to the huge increase in demand in the US and the huge increase in demand in Europe, uh, as we can get out of the pandemic, also as we rely more and more on e-commerce, uh, 
um, uh, it has a direct impact on shipping costs between these areas, but it also has an impact on other areas because basically carriers are increasing rates everywhere. Um, China also has an issue right now with um, uh, congestion at ports, uh, the, uh, the ports around Shenzhen in the south, the Yantian, Chiwan, and uh, um, I forgot the third one are highly congested. So uh, that creates additional costs, that creates delays for supply chain. So that has an impact on everyone. So actually what people are saying is that the Yantian, the current um, uh, congestion at ports in South, in south China, in the Shenzhen area, creates worse disruption than the Suez Canal blockage did uh, back in March. Uh, and so things are getting so bad in ocean transportation, rates are so high and uh, space is difficult and there's congestion, et cetera, et cetera, that it was just announced a few days ago, Home Depot, which is uh, this huge US um, hardware chain, which happens to be the third biggest importer in the US, they decided to, to charter their own ship in order to transport their own goods uh, because uh, things are so bad with, with ocean carriers and rates are so high. So it's quite interesting to see that. It's quite extreme, you know, uh, when, when we see that. We, we never see things like this where, you know, a retailer decides, okay, I'm going to do all this myself. Uh, very unusual. Uh, price, uh, rising prices of commodities, we all know about that. I'd just like to illustrate it with this slide here, which shows how much um, uh, prices have, uh, have gone up or on lumber, for example, on building materials um, in many parts of the world, particularly in the US. Uh, and uh, also to recognize, uh, to get us to the end of the presentation, to recognize the, the, um, the importance of the supply chain, uh, the US president has created a, a task force to look into that and to try to find solutions. So that highlights in a way that highlights the fact that it is, it has become a big a problem, a big issue for companies worldwide. The supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic and other factors uh, we see it in the automobile industry um, with this shortage of semi semiconductors. So all this to say here that uh, it's nice to see a US president who is working as opposed to spending his time golfing or, or sending tweets. Uh, and it's also good to see that the, the supply chain disruptions, challenges are recognized, are getting a higher profile and have a big impact, a bigger impact than they used to on the economy. And so hopefully this will have results, this will bring outcomes, this will bring solutions. The fact that it has gotten a higher, uh, higher up in our, in our priorities, you know, on a, on a worldwide scale. And so that brings me to the end of what I had prepared for you. I hope that uh, uh, it was interesting and that you enjoyed it. And I'm really happy to uh, hand the microphone over to Rosalind again so that we can have some exchanges and so we can uh, I can answer some of your questions should you have any. So I look forward to exchanging with you. Thank you so much for your attention. Over to you, Rosalind. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, so I will at the moment be asking questions um, to Christian. So if you guys have any, please remember to put them in the chat box. Um, but so far, we have a question um, from Susan. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. she asked, is there any data on how much cargo on the Evergreen, on the Ever Given was owned by smaller companies versus Ikea? Versus Ikea's, I think she means ideas of the world or, yes, or yeah, versus the Ikea's Ikea, of the that world. That is the okay. Ikea's, yeah, it's a good yeah. question, Susan. No, I think the, unfortunately that data is not public, but uh, my guess is that, uh, is that um, there, 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 there must be, in one way or another, there must be quite a few small companies that are that are stuck with it. I mean, you could say normally you could say that uh, it's going to be the large companies that will have. Um, it will be a majority of big companies that will have cargo on Evergreen because Evergreen is a, is a big company and it deals with big companies. But for sure, there's some small small companies that are stuck as well. Absolutely. It's just, it's mathematical. It's just, unfortunately, we don't have any data on that. Um, and, and that's hard to, uh, it's, it's data that's hard to, uh, to, um, to, to, to get. Uh, I'm not sure that it's available, but for sure there are some that are, that are stuck. And um, 
it's uh, it's unfortunate, but that's uh, you know these things happen sometimes, and uh, it, it it highlights the the risks involved in in, in, in trading internationally, and uh, um, there's ways to to minimize risks, but um, you can't uh, be a hundred percent protected. I think this is what the uh, what it boils down to. During the presentation, I also saw some of you were raising their hands. Uh, so yes, as Rosalind has reminded us, please write your questions in the chat. During the presentation, I noticed several people raising their hands. So sometimes it indicates that you have a comment to make or that you have a question to raise. So please use the chat. That's the most practical way of doing it um, with these webinars. So I encourage you to, uh, to raise uh, any questions that you have. And uh, so we painted this morning, we talked about mainly about today, we paint, talked about the evergreen situation in the, in the canal. Of course, we had to, to paint this with a broad brunch, broad, broad brush, as we say, you know, which was a high level presentation, but I hope it was interesting and it gave you some ideas or some uh, um, pointers as to areas that perhaps uh, we, you should pay more, we should pay more attention to in the future. I think uh, the Inco terms yeah, is a good one. Like Diana is saying, uh, um, thank you for your comment, Diana. Um, consider changing the Inco terms. So indeed, uh, that's something to, to think about um, and that, that we can learn from this, uh, uh, from this uh, incident is uh, pay more attention to the Inco term that you're using. Uh, and what I wanted to say also, because I think we don't have uh, uh, questions for the time being, what I wanted to say is, don't hesitate to ask any questions or make any comments that you have. Even if something, if you're not certain that you want to ask, please ask. Any questions that you have helps us, that help us clarify what we talked about is also going to be helpful for everybody. And also remember, there's no such thing as stupid questions. There's only stupid answers. So don't be shy. Is there any questions perhaps from Marie-Sabel or uh, of your own, on your own, um, some, some question or some, some thoughts you might want to, that, that might have been triggered by this presentation? No, I'm just looking at the participants that we have here. And I know we haven't uh, from the team, some of the regions, Africa and Asia specifically. Yes. That um, it will be nice to know if they do have some questions, especially because, you know, our clients are SMEs in those countries. And you pointed out very clearly that this is where the impact of what's, what happened is going to feel because this is a big company. You don't feel this or you can solve it and balance, but for an SME, it could be even going close in business exactly. at this point. Yes. So how do you see um, those regions, specifically SMEs from Africa and Asia being, in, being affected in the following months due to this incident? Yes, I think it has affected companies indirectly wor worldwide, uh, simply because it, it slowed down the flow of, of goods. And so we all know that uh, in, in, in our globalized world, we're all uh, sort of interconnected. And we, even if we're, if we're outside of that circle, uh, let's say we're in Africa, and uh, well, we might still reply on, uh, rely on supplies that are coming from suppliers that themselves have been affected by or some factories, you know, maybe we deal, we're in Africa and we deal with European factories that uh, didn't get their, uh, some of their parts or components uh, because they were stuck on the ever given. And then therefore their delivery of, of supplies to us are, are get delayed. So these things happen, uh, have a ripple effect, have a, have a cascading effect uh, everywhere, I think in, in one way or another. Um, And I wanted to, to pick Thank up on you. a point that, uh, you're welcome. I wanted to point, pick up on the point here, Eric here is mentioning, Eric Matrum is mentioning uh, on cargo insurance, we missed the seller's liability. Yes, indeed. I mean, the seller's liabilities and, and the buyer's liabilities. Um, when I wanted to, to, when I talked about cargo insurance, I just meant really the, um, how we can protect ourselves for, as to remind everyone that we can protect ourselves against damages by using cargo insurance. And, uh, 
Uh, so that, that was my main message, remind everyone that cargo insurance is an important risk management tool. And, uh, and I'd also remind everyone or inform everyone that it's also helpful to have cargo insurance if you run into a general average case, you know, a general average situation where strictly speaking in a general average situation, the, uh, um, the cargo doesn't get damaged. So you could think that since the cargo doesn't get damaged, uh, then there's no implication of insurance, but indeed there is. If you have cargo insurance, it, it covers you for the cost of the general average contribution. So uh, that, that was my main uh, purpose here, my main objective there. But yes, the seller has responsibility, has liabilities in, in, in getting, getting the cargo, um, making the cargo available and supply the cargo in good condition and um, arrange the, any of the logistics aspects based on the INCO term. And the buyer has a, has a liability also to accept delivery of the goods uh, on the other side and, and to do his part or her part based on the INCO term that has been agreed upon. Would you say that uh, this kind of risk also... Um would be possible through the Panama Canal? Um, could it happen? To, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Is, well, sure, uh, yeah. It's yeah. surprising that it hasn't happened. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, the Panama Canal is, uh, is more complex than the Suez Canal because it involves locks. So the good thing about the Suez Canal is that it's a sea level canal, which means uh, there's no locks. Um, so the only challenge is that there's a part where it's narrow and there's only traffic going one way. Um, so that's for swells, but for Panama, it's a bit more complex because Panama has three sets of locks because the water level is different on the Atlantic and on the Pacific. And also because the Panama Canal goes through uh, a mountain area in Panama. So uh, when they built the canal, they couldn't dig into the, uh, in, right into the ground. So the, the canal in some parts is elevated because of that, because of the terrain, because of the mountains in the center of Panama. Mm -hmm. And so having locks, then yes, when you have locks, that means uh, you know, it increases the chances of an incident happening. Uh, so, it's the, so from that point of view, you could say that strictly speaking, the uh, uh, Panama Canal is more risky uh, right. in a way. And, and so it could happen. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Would you say then that uh, this occurrence um, it increases uh, Canada's vulnerability and, and so uh, towards, you know, towards trade in that part of the world and therefore, um, you know, um, the, the um, focusing attention on Asia Pacific becomes uh, uh, indispensable or unavoidable. I mean, it increases everyone's vulnerability. I mean, uh, I think the worst, the more from, from the Panama Canal point of view, the more vulnerable ones really are. Uh, part of the world is Latin America because uh, if you have. Um, because all the exchanges between East and West go via the Panama Canal. Um, so I don't think that Canada is particularly vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, but yes, it is, it is vulnerable in a way. I think the US is vulnerable because uh, a lot of US trade goes via the Panama Canal between East and West and, and Latin America is also. If you're selling goods from, um, from Peru to Brazil, well, you use the Panama Canal, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, so, what I'm trying to say is that um, it seems like uh, it seems like uh, the risk um, being presented um, with respect to Asia Pacific, you know, the Asia Pacific countries yes. from Canada yes. is lesser because you don't have to go through through this uh, this uh, the risk of these canals, the risk yes. posed by these canals. Yes, yes, yes. So absolutely, yes. So from that point of view, you're totally right. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, I agree with that 100. percent Yes, very true. Um, I believe we only have time for about two more questions. Um, so Ben Nayun has a question as well, too. Um, she says, oh, sorry, please advise FOB or CIF better for exporters in terms of risk on ocean transportation. Yes, so uh, Ben, yes, uh, actually FOB or CIF, as far as risk is the same from the, from the seller's point of view, for the exporter's point of view. 
because uh, the transfer of risk is exactly the same. So under, under CIF, the exporter pays for the ocean freight, but the transfer of risks take place as if the INCO term was FOB. So it actually works out the same. And so they would be the less, uh, they would be the better terms for from an exporter's point of view, yes. Uh, the one that's more tricky from an exporter's point of view is DAP or DDP or DPU. But from a risk point of view, CIF is equivalent to FOB. And this is something we also, I just wanted to take the opportunity, if, you, if, if I may, Rosalind, for just a second, to mention that we were talking a while ago, we're talking about providing an inco terms training uh, here at TFO. So if there is any, any need, if there's a re requirement, if you're interested in having an, uh, an inco terms training, it's something we may be able to do, um, uh, to do for you if there's enough interest and enough uh, requests you know, from, from several of you. Uh, it's something we'd be prepared to do or we may be able to do. Um, is provide an, a, a training, a, a webinar specific on INCO terms. Look at them one by one to see which one is more beneficial to exporters. Um, I believe there's a question from Mohammed as well too. And he says, can you tell us about the problem of the Chinese port you mentioned at the end of the presentation? Yes, so uh, there's been uh, there's been uh, because of the huge increase in traffic and in, in exports for out of China after especially the high demand from the U.S. but also from Europe. There's there's huge congestion problems, particularly at the port of Yantian in uh, in Shenzhen in the Shenzhen area. And so because of that, many carriers who are who are operating in that part of the world actually don't are omitting the port of Yantian right now and they're not going there. So that means that cargo accumulates uh, and also it, uh, it, uh, it, means that there, it means there's delays. It means that if, if you had cargo, if you were expecting on some cargo to leave this week and uh, you know the, the port of Yantian and Maersk or, or, or Evergreen or CMA tells you, well, sorry, this week I'm not going to Yantian because it's too congested there. It's going to take too long to load my vessel. I'm not going there. So it has a cascading effect on, 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 on lots of people because cargo then gets further delayed. Uh, so it has been an issue. Uh, it's been an ongoing issue for the last week. And because of that, also the impact it has is that carriers have increased rates again. So rates are extremely high right now. They're about 10 times what they used to be uh, a year and a half ago, but they are continuing to increase because there's still high demand for goods. And uh, even though there's congestion in Yantian, people continue to buy from, from China and from the Shenzhen area, and there's, there's demand for goods. And so therefore what carriers do, they say, okay, so then we'll increase our prices. And then, uh, so that has that impact too. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, we don't unfortunately have enough time to answer any more questions. However, I would like to mention that um, Christian has agreed to share his presentation. So if you can take the time to fill out the surveys, we will be able to send you the presentation afterwards. Um, and if you guys have any other questions, you can always send that email to me and I could forward it to Christian or if there's anything. Um, and also we will um, have this webinar available on our website in a few days. So you can rewatch it whenever you need to refer back to what was discussed. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you, you Rosalind, and thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank Good you. luck, everyone. Thank you.